Great. Well, it's really lovely to um, to join my colleagues Elizabeth and Lynn as we talk about what the future of provenance might be. Um, I'm really looking forward to this conversation and uh, to learn from you and to have a discussion about something that we're all so passionate about. Uh, Lynn, do you want to start out with an introduction and talk about your research and what you've been working on? Sure. Thank you, David. And yes, hello to everyone. So my name is Lynn Rother, and I am a professor for provenance studies at Leuphana University Lüneburg in Germany. And why I was thrilled to be invited to this conference of the International Catalog of Bresony Association, and especially in this panel with my esteemed colleagues, Elizabeth Goyarev and David Newberry, is that we are at I think an extremely exciting moment of rethinking provenance. To everyone in this audience, it is clear how important provenance research is, whether for authenticity or attribution questions or for identifying unlawfully appropriated objects. It's also clear how time consuming and resource intensive it is, and it is ongoing. It's mainly catalog resume scholars and museum curators who continue to invest countless hours to create a better understanding of an object's provenance. And of course, in the digital age, we are using computers to store and also more and more to publish the results of the research. But I think we as a scholarly community are not yet using provenance information or to be more precise provenance data the way we could to help with research management and efficiency, but also to be able to ask really other questions so I would like to use this opportunity to show A, where we are, and B, to give an idea where I think it's time to rethink our practices with regards to provenance data. My background is in museums, and therefore I'm using three museum provenance examples to show current practices. So what you can see here on this slide are three provenance records, one from the website of the Metropolitan Museum, one from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston and one from the National Gallery of Art in Washington. All three museums are best practice in every sense. The research was conducted by dedicated experts. One of them, Tori Reed from the MFA Boston spoke earlier today and they have applied the American provenance standards published by the AAM in 2001. This means for example, that direct transfers between owners are indicated by a semicolon while periods are used when there is a gap. And I don't want to go too much into details, but what I want to point out is that all three works have a shared history. And if you're an expert in this field, you might see it immediately. I'm referring to the Hotel Trou sales in Paris in the early 1920s, as I'm highlighting here in red. All three works are owned by Germans living in France at the outbreak of World War I, namely Kahnweiler, Wendland, and Goetz. Their collection of stock was sequestered by the French government and then sold at the auction house Hotel Trou in 1920 or 1922, respectively. The terminology varies slightly from sequestration to liquidation and confiscation, as highlighted here by red circles. And also where it appears, whether in the provenance itself or in the notes section differs. Of course, every written provenance statement includes aspects of interpretation and the authority, how to write it, name it, and what terminology to use should lay by the author or by the institution publishing it. This current practice is also not a problem when we as experts look at such provenance records. We know how to read them. We know the context, or if we don't, we can find out by consulting other sources. And then we use the information and tell our own stories. But if we want to look at all works that were sequestered due to World War I and then sold in the early 1920s, because we are interested in the art market at the time or the impact of these sales, for example, we have to search through hundreds of provenance records on museum websites and catalog resumes just to identify the works in question. This cumbersome work that we all know isn't even research, it's merely data collecting and computers are so much better at data gathering than human beings and moreover there is so much digitally available information already out there. But to really use computers for these kind of inquiries, we need to organize our data differently. At the moment the data exists in isolation, it is not linked 
and it is unstructured or insufficiently structured. For example, when different types of data, such as locations, people, and dates, are recorded in one text field, and it is inconsistent. I think it is time that we apply standards that anticipate machine readability. But to be clear, as I said earlier, I think the final provenance statement published by a catalog resume or by an institution should align with their own interpretation and standards. But controlled vocabularies such as the ULAN or AAT edited and provided by the Getty Research Institute or Wikidata with regards to locations and objects, for example, allow both. So to stay with these examples, every provenance event related to one of these hotel tour sales with whatever terminology in the museum provenance record should at least be linked to controlled vocabularies. It can be linked to Paris, to a Tetro, even better to a specific sale or even to a specific lot number. The enormous remodel project of the Getty Provenance Index, which is on its way to publish a massive amount of auction and art market information as linked open data, makes me therefore very excited, but its potential can only be fully used when object related provenance information is linked to it, which means mainly the data created by catalog resumes and museums. And I think from the museum perspective, one of the biggest current challenges to create structured linkable provenance information are the collection management systems that are commonly used. And I am excited that Rupert Shepard from the National Gallery in London has gathered a group to rethink how to record provenance information in TMS by gallery systems. Another initiative that I'm part of is the so-called Linked Art Project, spearheaded by Rob Sanderson, formerly at the Getty Foundation and now at Yale, but also my research project at Leuphana University called Modern Migrant aims to be a model for bringing provenance research and data science together. And well, I won't go into the details, but what we are doing is collecting thousands of provenance records of impressionist and modern paintings to test computational methods and ask new questions with regard to art market and collecting practices. And we are now one year in of a five year grant period. It creates many headaches on how to recall all the ambiguities consistently. But yeah, we are also overly excited to be able to test this and so of course I'm happy to, to answer any questions, but I would also love to hear where current digital catalog resumes initiatives are heading. And so I'm looking forward to our conversation. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you, Lynn. Elizabeth, would you sure. to talk about your work as well? Yes, thank you very much, David. Uh, Lynn, thank you for talking about several of the issues that we're currently dealing with now at the Wildenstein Platner Institute. I'm the executive director of the WPI, and we are committed to sharing uh, digital art historical information and also to publishing digital catalog raisonnés. First and foremost, right now at the WPI is the forthcoming Tahitian portion of the digital Gauguin catalog raisonné. And this has been a project that has occupied the staff of the WPI um, in both its researchers and its tech team for the last several years. And it has really brought to the fore a lot of the issues that uh, we have perhaps neglected as traditional provenance researchers in terms of controlled vocabularies and the meaning of how we're describing ownership and possession. And I just like to talk about a very specific example with regard to our project um, that came about uh, in terms of communications and understanding between our tech team and our research team. So our tech team designed a cataloging platform for us that is incredibly sophisticated and uses structured data and controlled vocabularies, and we refer to the contents of the data uh, or the descriptions of the types of data that we have as either agents or events. So in other words, if you are an art dealer or an artist or a collector, you are an agent. If you are an, or if there is an exhibition or a sale or a publication um, or any type of uh, event, so to speak, in the, the lifetime of a work of art, um, that's noted as such. It's, it's referred to as an event. 
Recently, um, we came across a situation where we were describing a work of art that was owned by a German museum, it was a Gauguin, owned by a German museum, and during the Second World War, the German government deemed it to be degenerate. So they took it down from the museum and carried it off uh, and gave it to uh, one of the higher ups in the SS as a gift. So in thinking about how to describe this event, was it an ownership event or was it a possession event? And for our tech team, it didn't make very much of a difference because um, we were talking about it as an event, but visually it makes a lot of difference because we were rendering possession events with an indent, a little indentation underneath transference. Um, but ownership events, we were just listing kind of stacked one on top of each other. But basically, if you're talking about a work that belongs to a German museum and the German government confiscates it, is it a transference of ownership or is the German government taking possession of it and then transferring the ownership to the, the military person who then hung it on his wall? So this opened up a large discussion um, between our tech team and our research team about the visual shorthand that goes in the design of provenance rendering and how in that visual shorthand, um, like the uh, commas and the semicolons, you start to read provenance in a very particular way. So therefore, you need to really investigate not only the terms that you're using, as Lynn describes, but the way that you're displaying those terms, because that in and of itself can have a particular meaning. We also found that with our provenance research team, they did a deep dive into investigating exactly what type of a possession or ownership events we were talking about, looking at um, the documentation that went into the sale or transference or um, uh, the purchase of uh, at auction or non-purchase or return of a work of art. And they had an enormous amount of data that they footnoted. Their footnotes became visual clutter that needed to be hidden from the screen because if you were a user looking at the screen yes you had a wealth of information but how to parse this information without burying it unintentionally so there were a lot of design elements that really needed to be worked out and needed to be agreed upon um, on both sides of the table from tech and from researchers who didn't want their research to be undermined by the design but from the tech perspective, um, we needed to render the research in a consistent way with these controlled vocabularies and structures. So that's something that has really shaped our project um, in general. Uh, and I think what the decisions that we made are going to cascade to our next projects that are on the horizon. And it's it's uh, resulted in a lot of interesting conversations. And also we, we find that as researchers, we hold opinions very strongly that we um, ne didn't necessarily think we cared about so much. And it brings to the fore again, this idea that the old ways of research and documentation really have to be called to question, especially when we're working in a tech environment with these vocabularies. So with that, I would hope that we can open this discussion and David, I hope you can uh, guide us in, in solving some of these problems. Lovely. Thank you. And yeah, um, I'm David Newbury. I'm the head of software at the Getty, um, where I manage a team of engineers and UX designers who work on technical problems in art history, um, particularly with a focus on enabling people to make use of data, collections data, um, as a collecting institution. And for me, what that really means is that we're thinking about about two problems. One is about how do we actually capture this information? Um, which is a huge issue that both of you were addressing. The other is how do we then display that information? And before I was at Getty, I worked on several other large linked data projects. One was the American Art Collaborative, which was about bringing together the records of multiple institutions into a single interface. And that's one of the challenges that I can imagine, particularly with catalog resumes, is that there's not a single organization that has the data. And so if we're going to do this sort of computing work that Lynn's been talking about over top of it, um, 
there needs to be a level of standardization to make it so that the computer can understand it. Um, the other project I worked on was Art Tracks, which was a really deep dive into this history of recording digital provenance. Um, and when we, in thinking through that work, there were three threads of it, which both of you have brought up. Um, one of them was, how do we record that history of interactions between people and artwork when it comes to art as a physical thing? And it's really, I think both of you are bringing up this question, which is that um, the interactions of people and artwork are not consistent. Uh, for humans, we do really weird things with objects. Um, and there's, it's hard to structure that into a single set of terms because um, we do such weird, inconsistent things. And I think we also then run into this issue of interfaces and affordances for the poor people who have to record this information. How do we balance that computer's real need for structure and consistency to make everything explicit and boring and as consistent as possible with the researcher's desire to footnote everything and to capture everything, record all of that nuance down? And I think, as you were saying, Lynn, um, the words we use to describe this and Elizabeth, the presentation we use to describe this really, really matters. Um, and how do we find consistent languages that help us as people talk about it? Um, and I think the last thing that I'm thinking, that I think about through this work um, is uh, structured data isn't a moral good. There is no, um, we don't do this because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, we do it because it's useful. Um, and particularly, it's useful for people like me, who are responsible for manipulating and presenting data. It makes the computers good. It makes the computers happy. Um, and so where is that balance between you know, the work that it actually matters in this field, the art history research, the art market information, the catalog resumes, and the need to make the computer people happy? Um, because computers are an incredible enabling technology, but they're not the we don't do this to make computers happy because there's computers don't care at all about the history of art. And so with that, I think maybe we should open this up to a, um, a conversation where we talk about what we are doing and why. And I think if we can start off, how do you think this move to structured data is changing the practice of provenance and catalog resumes? Um, why are we doing this and um, how does it change what we've done for hundreds of years um, with this introduction of computers and databases. Elizabeth, do you want to take the first crack? Oh, sure, thank you. Um, my staff, who is working on not only the Gauguin Catalog Raisonné, but several other uh, traditional Catalog Raisonné projects um, that we took over um, with our founding, are traditional art historical researchers, well-schooled in not only um, the uh, dealer relationships among the artists um, and their lifetime agents, but also in the collectors um, who acquired these pieces well into the 20th century. And so they, there was a, a tremendous knowledge um, and assumptions and conclusions uh, that were made about these relationships. Now, I think with the structured data and the, I hate to say it, but kind of the, the shoehorning of, of data into particular categories, we start to question these conclusions that we've made. And it's sort of uh, forced a reckoning in just the, the, the fluency that we have in talking about how a work existed in history over time. Um, was a work sold? Was it bought back? Was it uh, consigned by the artist who then went to his own sale and because of the appearance of success, bought it himself uh, in disguise so that it looked like it was sold? Beforehand, these were not necessary, these were anecdotal features. But when it comes to kind of capturing these moments in time, um, as anecdotal as they may be, we're forced to give them structure. And I think on the one hand, um, it, it's a very interesting uh, occurrence for us to really think about these things in those terms. But on the other hand, it really does create a lot of uncomfortable dilemmas where we're being forced to label something that might not necessarily have a label to it. 
Um, we talk about a lot in our catalog raisonné investigation, edge cases. And it's sometimes the edge cases take over in terms of how we're spending our time trying to parse this data. Oftentimes you have a picture that the artist consigns it to his dealer, the dealer sells it to a well-known collector, it stays in that collector's family and then it goes up to auction. That's very straightforward. But what happens like in that case that I'm talking about where Gauguin in particular uh, went to an auction and bought a lot of his work back because he, the appearance of it not selling would have been terrible for him. How do you really capture that without overloading your, uh, your reader with a lot of the bells and whistles that would have to go into describing that situation? Can't you just link back to a descriptive essay that talks about the whole thing? Or do you have to write it all out in the provenance? So it really forces you to rethink your telling of the story. And I think for our researchers um, who have told the stories of works of art for many, many years, it becomes a new way of thinking and it's, it's quite challenging. So for us, I think that has been something um, that we've really had to come to terms with that the old ways of doing provenance research and relaying that research are no longer valid because as these new modes of technology display provenance research, users are going to expect more. Um, and just listing a simple provenance without having the background information and without having the digital paper trail to support your conclusions is not gonna be acceptable any longer. One of the things that I've, I've really enjoyed in working with provenance and this is realizing that uh, what art historians tend to really enjoy are those hapax moments, the exceptions, the weird things, the craziness. And speaking as a, as a programmer and also someone who's used to working in data aggregations, the idea that like you take the 5% of weird things and just throw them out and work with the 95% of consistency makes it so much sense. And that's the exact opposite of what art historians do. And so I think so much of the work of what we're doing here is taking two cultures and two different senses of the difference between art history as story and data as numbers in a database and trying to mix those two cultures together. Yeah, and I would also come into that because I think in the cultural heritage field, we do have one part is to is documentation or not one part is actually crucial. And of course, that means we want to record every detail. We want to know that this work was at auction, even if it wasn't sold. But then bringing that now to what computers request to make the strict distinction between changes of ownership and changes of possession that we as human beings, when you read it in these like textual provenance records, we can easily, we know the context. And then depending on what we want to use it, we are able to distinguish, but computers are not. So, so I agree that this, that yeah, the, the edge cases still, we can't leave them out entirely we want to record them, but the question is, of course, how, how, how detailed are we then creating interfaces when we have also many works that are just straightforward? And that's right. That's right. I, I think for us also, um, it is becoming this whole, you know, do you forego uh, all of the edge cases to focus on the majority and the clarity of the rendering? But for art historians, um, it becomes all the more important to be clear on what it is you are foregoing and not to dismiss it. Because yes, that is really the interesting part. The edge cases are the interesting parts of this. And I don't think you'll ever meet an art historian who doesn't want to talk about um, all of the, the the complexities in the transference of ownership. That's what's fascinating to us. The thought that we can just do away with that. Um, often in, in the past, I think a lot of uh, art historians and a lot of provenance researchers, my, I have to say myself included, would say, oh, this is too complicated to explain to people. I'm just gonna you know, put it in my own files and present this as cleanly as possible. Now I'm talking about when I did this maybe 20 years ago. However, that is no longer the case. And um, the elegance of design becomes first and foremost in this so that we can satisfy 
both of these worlds of, of, of tech and of research. And it's, it's interesting when we think about, I think, and this may be one of the differences between the catalog resume work and say the provenance index work that I'm more familiar with, because I think when you start talking about structured data, how much of it is about presentation of that data out and how much of it is about querying across the data set. Mm -hmm. And those are really different needs and you structure information differently to accommodate those needs. Um, and I think there's a sense that we can, that structured data is just a thing, not tied to a purpose of what you want to do with that data. And I think, I know I've certainly learned this is that, you know, in choosing which, the, which parts you structure mm -hmm. and why, you, you do that with a, an end goal in mind that's a human goal, not a computer goal. And it doesn't always translate nicely back to other goals that you'd want to do over that. Go ahead. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I, but I also think that the, the controlled vocabularies are really key for, because I do think exactly what I also tried to, to say earlier, why it is so important still for human beings, how their research is then represented on like museum websites and catalog resumes. If they want to use the word confiscated, sequestrated or seized, um, this is their, I think it's their interpretation and that right so, but then there are legal issues related to it, what we have to take in mind. And the other thing is still, we need to come up with also, I think better controlled vocabularies or like the detail vocab. And I think the provenance research has not really actually provided yet, for example, the Getty AAT. That's one of the things that I would like to, to take on in the next months, basically, to like start with a group of people who I was interested and who there are like German colleagues, the American colleagues who have the same need and then create the vocabulary. So if it is World War I, it is a sequestration, but alternative words that you can use are also Etc. And then we have this URI and we can link it to it. And then I think it allows this, this flexibility. And the same with, with, with you, um, Elizabeth pointed out, the degenerate art. It's like there are, I mean, there are like thousands of works that have <laughs> been removed from German museums. So ideally, this exact moment of when they were removed from the museum is one data set that we link these works to and that makes them identifiable and then you can still decide how you want to phrase it and because there is like in that example technically from a legal perspective one could argue that it didn't change ownership because it was public property but of course if it was a city museum the owner was technically the city so then the state removes it but they removed it for the 1937 exhibition Degenerate Art. So it was actually just designated as Degenerate Art for the exhibition in 1937. And only retrospectively, it was legalized by a law on May 31st in 1938. So then the ownership changed. So where, well, where did that footnote go? That's well, exactly. <laughs> but I think this is like the place to store that complexity should. And, and I always argue for the AAT at the Getty because its advantage is that it is edited by art historians. And then still they, I mean, it is open to, to, to scholars contribute to their terminology. And so that it is the, that it, yeah, that it is the, open to 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 anyone's sort of interpretation but still there is one where we know this means that you know i think go, go ahead. sorry Dave, go ahead. I, and i think one of the um undersung benefits of aat is that everything gets a number because mm -hmm. i know one of the things that computer people tend to do is we work so much in the abstract we're always trying to communicate to humans about the the weird code that we're writing. And so we tend to pick the most evocative words to describe things because it helps us communicate abstract concepts. And the number of times I've had arguments where it's, a, no, I'm just using a random word because I need a word. Uh, the idea that we could give all of these concepts numbers that takes away that nuance, that strips yes. away that sort of emotional loading that 
sequestered has or degenerate has. Yes. To say this is a concept that we all share, the word and the legal framework that's underneath it, you know, we can agree on, but we want to pull away from that presentation of the information because when we talk about authorship, authorship is as much about that emotional engagement with it. Someone is telling a story. Um, we don't, the computer doesn't need the story. And it, if we try to load in all of the emotional power we can in that presentation into the structured data, we get into arguments. And so what can we do to, to let computers work with abstract information and let people layer on that presentation and that nuance and that authorship on top of it? Well, I think that's such an interesting point because I was thinking as Lynn was talking about um, uh, the degenerate art and our agreement of what exactly happens there, I realized that's a very Eurocentric discussion. How do we talk about um, the ownership of works that were taken from other cultures without it turning political? Um, and so maybe if we, uh, as provenance researchers working in Europe and the United States might agree on that, what does the culture of origin say about that acquisition? And if we loaded it with a term, we're, we're basically opening ourselves up for a discussion that we might have not been prepared for. So I'm interested in that idea of, of using um, numerical expressions to depoliticize and to di divest uh, uh, an event of any type of emotion. Um, but then I wonder, maybe both of you have experienced this, um, how do you present that to a traditional researcher? Okay, you're, not, you're just gonna code this. You're not going to describe it. You're not. The provenance is just going to be a series of numbers. How is how is that going to work? Is that where we're going? David, can I? I, I think there's no contradiction because I do think there is the interpretation and the textual statement that can be done by the researcher and then publish it in even the digital catalog resume or even in a book. But then still, this refers to the ULAN, or in that case, the AAT number XYZ. And I think the great thing, of course, is also by controlled vocabularies and then that they are digital. So they are not set in stone. So of course, if whoever has a better definition or a different view on it, this can be exactly that others see it as and like or who it's like or this is a contested or like con conflicting terminologies being used mm -hmm. I, I think but once it is linked to that data set to make it sound very easy at least there is that connection there and it allows flexibility to like rethink the the, the concepts behind it on both places where the where the object related provenance information is as well as where the like authoritative event art market collecting uh, information lays. And I think, I think it is that, one of the things I've learned as I've been working with this is that every time you try to introduce computers, you end up digging deeper into nuance and abstraction because computers are so dumb and you need, you need to actually solve things that you could just do in your head without thinking about it. And I think what you're saying, Lynn, really ties to the fact that when we think about recording provenance, we think about the research and then the expression of that research as a, as a piece of work that we do together. We learn something and then we write it down. Mm -hmm. And what, what we're really doing here is saying, we learn something, we structure it, and then we pre present it back up to the world as a, as a visualization or as a catalog resume online. Mm -hmm. But there's a difference between the putting data into a database and then pulling it out to show to a human. Um, and that, that pulling it out to show to a human is where we add in our authorship, where we add in our decisions about what we show, how we prioritize things, what words we use to describe things. Uh, and there's not, there's not a one canonical presentation of structured data. Um, it is a presentation of that data for a purpose. And there's, there's lots of nuance you can go into with the underlying model having the, the fields you choose to structure, which things are you do record what you don't also adds in that level of, of meaning making that you do at that schema at the schema level but so much happens at that presentation level to really to direct human attention 
Mm -hmm. And so much of storytelling is about directing human attention to the things that you think matter. I think it's something that you said um, earlier about um, what is the end goal of all of this. I think that's something that a lot of us, myself included, have a hard time remembering when we're struggling over, you know, how do we how do we code this or how do we term this. Um, the way that I like to think about it is it's going to help me in my searches years from now if let's just say all the catalog raisonnés that are in production right now we all just get on board with this idea of authorized vocabularies and we're painstakingly structuring our data and using ulan and describing things in an, in an agreed upon federated way what end is this going to what what's the result of this and the way that i think about it is okay so i want to search for how many um, women collected gogan's work in the 1970s and they bought it themselves but they uh, also had other impressionist works that they also bought and how many of those works were inherited from their parents and when did what like these women collectors like what else did they get on their own as opposed to what they inherited so all of it, this whole kind of like stream of consciousness of querying that i do in my head that it would take me many many weeks years to figure out myself by going through a variety of sources could theoretically be typed in to this structured data amalgamator and I could have my answer. Similar to Google, maybe, is that right? Is that even possible on the horizon? I don't know, but I think that's the thought. You can ask such a question and get reliable results. Yeah, you can, you can ask that question and it will take you probably two minutes to, to have the data. But then, of course, you as an art historian can ask the really interesting questions, right? You have more time to actually then dig into that. So why was that person who collected that or who inherited these works, why did she suddenly start? What was the moment? And then to go into that quantitative part, into the actually art historical part of reception, what triggered that moment, who were the people? We have so much more free time on hand then to actually ask these right. interesting questions when we have computers to help us really with the tedious data collecting. And I think, yeah, so, so far we so much rely on and examples to tell bigger stories, but we actually don't, we, so many things we don't know about art, art market practice and collecting practices in a bigger picture. And also if we think away from France, Germany, North America, and if we, if we look actually at the fascinating global mm -hmm. questions that we can ask, I mean, then it is, we, the computers really allow us to actually be in a way to not to not be as biased as we are now because we keep on relying on the research that's already done but then when we see the works that are for example in south american museums it can suddenly be connected as of course history was connected right yeah and and, and i think it's but i think it's important also to point out that the computer, most of the work there is not the computer. What it really is, is the, the painstaking work of coding, of capturing that information. And I feel like one of the, one of the hardest problems here is not going to be about vocabularies or databases or interfaces. It's really going to be about motivation. Mm -hmm. Art historians love that asking questions and doing discovery but the enabling work of adding it into the database and capturing it and structuring it and coding it um, is so, so important to enable, I think as you were saying, your future self, uh, but, but it's, not, it's not publishable, it's not, um, it's not research, it's just hard work and boring work and not glamorous. And so how do we, how do we build that into a practice? Is it who does that work? Because, yeah. If I've learned anything from the past 10 years of trying to do this, it's if somebody it doesn't matter if you know it, if you haven't typed it into the computer, it's I can't do anything with it. And so how do we incentivize people to do that work of typing things into computers? That's right. That's right. Also, in, and the incentive 
of course, being the end results. But when that end result is not necessarily um, tangible or um, relatable, it becomes very, very difficult. And it is, it, it's a cultural struggle. And I see that um, among my own colleagues who have, as I said, um, been working as researchers for decades and to incentivize them to do it a different way, it is very difficult because it's painstaking. And it, in a way, it does seem like a waste of time because you're working for the greater good that sadly might you know, be at, at, in a future that you might not be present for. So it, it's very grim to think about that. But yes, this whole idea of getting everybody on board with doing this work are there short-term um, results? Are there short-term benefits to this that we can see next week or tomorrow? I, I'm hoping with our catalog raise A, people will see it and they say, oh, look at all this fielded data. You can ask all these queries. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that this, this will be one of them. But again, um, yeah, I wonder if, if either of you have come across some short-term. I would, yes, I would almost, I would slightly disagree with you, David, because I feel that is the moment you, when you are either in a big catalog resonate project with like thousands of works or when you are in a museum and the, at the moment museums have some of them have hundreds of thousands of provenance records someone has put them in they are digitally available and still no one can ask the question what were the works that were offered or that were on the art market in paris in the 1920s or if we think in Nazi era provenance research, what were the works that have what are the works that have Nazi era gaps? Let's focus on those. These questions at the moment we can't answer, and the reason is that the information is in so many instances in free text. And the other thing is suddenly there is a new new person in charge and says we want to have a different format. That also means you need to rewrite the entire record hand by hand instead of saying now we don't use semicolons anymore we <laughs> use just always periods which if we have structured data is not even uh, of any concern to the catalogers to the art historians to the curators now it is the it department just right programming it and it takes a minute to change it so i think that is the one thing where you have that immediate. It's like when you actually work on going, when it's not, that's the project and now I'm done. But when it's, when you are in charge of doing that for decades. And the other thing is what I also have hope. I mean, the, the younger generations, right? We are still, what are we digital aliens or digital migrants? But yeah. I mean, it's so now with my students, they grew up with computers. It is they type much faster and for them to record, a pro to write a provenance on a Word document and to print it out and put it in the object file and not immediately recording it in a way that they can actually make these queries. I, I have hope that <laughs> we can also back up from. <laughs> yeah, but I do agree with Elizabeth, but if we're going to incentivize people to do this, there needs to be a, a concrete benefit to the person in that time, as opposed to, you know, there's only so much I'm willing to do for my future self. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think that is really, if I'm imagining what, what we need out of this, it is, it is the, the vocabularies and the really rich sort of presentations of this information but things that start to show what you could do with this that you couldn't do before. It's something that says this extra, you know, when we were thinking about this in art tracks, we said there were two things we're trying to do. One is to minimize the amount of labor it takes to do that extra work of coding, because, you know, I can convince myself to do 5% more work for my future self, but not twice as much. And the other one is what is that immediate thing you could do that shows that this has a benefit outside of what we've already done. And I think, you know, maybe it is the reformatting of the text automatically, or maybe it is data visualizations and graphs. But what can we do that says, this is something that the work you've done benefits you immediately? So we can build, because I think, I think you're right, the real future of this is that asking questions across data that we couldn't ask because we didn't have all the information in one place. 
a library where you can find the, it's like a library where you can find the exact paragraph of the right book at exactly the right moment, lay them all out. Um, but that's a, that's a long-term future. It's a long-term future and it also requires a reckoning uh, about the privacy of information and the proprietary nature of information because certain provenance research is very time consuming and sometimes it's thankless. Um, you spend you know, months trying to figure out a, a trend, the nature of a transaction and it, it was revelatory to you and you are so proud of yourself and anybody who knows the project is extremely happy to have this information, but no one really understands what it took for you to find out that information. So you're not necessarily um, incentivized to just give it away. And I think that um, in this whole change of C from just the free form provenance to the structured and digital provenance, there really needs to be an incentivization among provenance researchers to be forthcoming and to share their hard work. Because there certainly are provenance researchers who will do the work and they're just as happy to put it in the file and take the file with them, as opposed to putting it in the database you know, forever after and letting it be part of just the public domain of information. So I think that there, there does need to be some type of um, reckoning in terms of you know, the, the work that we're doing. Is it for the greater good? Uh, or is it really, you know, for our own personal gain and glory as researchers? Because that certainly is an issue. Yeah. And I think anytime you're doing this kind of the work, it becomes also a team sport. Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, I, I can't imagine, Elizabeth, that the work you're doing is, there's no author of the Go Game Catalog Resume. It's a huge team of people working together. And I think that's a, changing our incentives and our motivations to say that kind of teamwork is mm -hmm. really important and we can it's good to have been part of a team is a huge shift from a i wrote the article that's right that's absolutely right yeah and and your work is so dependent on the other pieces that people are providing to you and those those uh, every element of your construction becomes equally important to achieving that end goal but i also i think there's also the part that that like for the for the real narrative and storytelling, how you come to the provenance, this is also this is essay material, right? That should find its place uh, to books mm -hmm. and to journals. And I do think part of the yeah, that Nazi era provenance research became such a so such a growing business is that uh, there are so many more journals and books dedicated to that topic. So I think there's room for that. And then there's the other part of like really the provenance data and the notes section, how did we come to that data? But I feel here what's really also an incentive for researchers is like, because especially if you have done that hard work and you actually really, you know, you found the impossible or the like, you went to Paris, you found it in a library because you have 10 works that are affected by that transaction, then someone else, maybe there was one Cezanne in the deal and you were looking at 10 Gauguin's, but then it is finding this, oh, probably the Gauguin people have already figured that out. Mm -hmm. then having that, having to find that information easily and then to make use of someone else's research and then spend your time on other as fascinating rabbit holes that you can go down. I think in problems research, we don't run out of intriguing question and rabbit holes. So if any, if there's any provenance I need to solve, someone has already solved it. I'm always happy. And <laughs> <laughs> another one. So I think that's also an incentive that then you actually really find easily or a lot easier what people have already done and to avoid then this long research while it's already known to to the field mm -hmm. just because someone was focusing focusing on an entirely different artist you might not find it immediately but then with data connected you can and i think yeah yeah i think that's if there's anything this is going to do it is going to be to continue to think of this as a community and a community of practice and a community of data not not just any one work, but we're all working on the same enormous art historical problem. Well, 
thank you both. And I would happily talk to you forever, but we should probably end our discussion and open it up to questions from our audience. <laughs>